Well, we are in the book of Zechariah, and we've entered the exciting climactic portion of the book. The first uh, six chapters being involved with visions in one night, and then chapter seven and eight, sort of a historical interlude where, as a priest, he responds to some priestly kinds of inquiries. And then chapters 9 and 10 start the last half of the book, 9 through 14, which deals with prophecy as we normally think of it in the sense of the first and second advent. In chapter 11, I'm very excited about it because it's quite a chapter, and uh, we're going to, uh, I think, see it full of some surprises. Now, the predictions in this chapter, chapter 11 of Zechariah, We're given quite a while after the former passages, after the completion of the temple by Zerubbabel. And it addresses some concerns that are more distant from the prophet. And uh, there's going to be a disastrous scattering of the people after Zechariah. You have to realize that he uh, has been ministering in a period where they've been regathered after the Babylonian experience, after seven years of captivity, rebuilding the temple. But his message has to do with a scattering that's yet future. Now, it's very hard to find uh, good, competent commentators in Zechariah because many of them get too close to the details and don't stand back to get the thrust of the whole passage, in my view. And uh, one of the things that this chapter is going to be dealing with is why the blessings and promises of the previous chapter we're in abeyance as far as Israel is concerned. There are all kinds of promises that uh, seem to be um, expired or, or held up, and he's going to explain. One of the things that we're going to discover in this chapter is very common in Hebrew literature to have the effect described first and then the cause for the effect. We tend in the West to think of the cause and then the effect, think of it chronologically. But the structure of the Hebrew passages are not necessarily so. And uh, what we're going to discover, to give you a sort of a preview, is that by Israel rejecting her Messiah, uh, they will experience rejection themselves. In fact, that's going to even take as its climax accepting a false Messiah. And that's really what this chapter is going to uh, deal with. All of the attendant darkness and woe that we're going to see uh, is a necessary prelude to the second coming of Jesus Christ and uh, to bring in the kingdom. And uh, we're going to see in this chapter, we're going to see presented Jesus as the good shepherd in his first advent, where he will give his life for the sheep. But it will also present a glimpse of another shepherd who will shear the sheep and kill them for food. Now... um, There's a desolation very poetically described in the first few verses of the chapter. And there are many views about those verses. They try to apply them to many different things. But if you take the chapter as a whole and get its sweep, I think it becomes much more clearly in focus. And the context of the whole chapter is the rejection of Israel because of her rejection of the Messiah. And that's a hypothesis. You should not accept that. I'm sharing an opinion, a view, an overview. And like all of the things in all of our studies, we encourage you to remember uh, what Luke warned you about Chuck Missler. In Acts 17.11, he said uh, that you should uh, receive the word with all openness of mind, but search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. So I'm expressing a view, and I hope the view is constructive and puts this in perspective, and yet you should always test this through your own study, not only of this chapter, but how it fits in. Because your protection against confusion... Your protection against some deviant idea is always to place it in the context of the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. So that's, that, that is your part of the assignment. But uh, let's turn to Zechariah chapter 11, verse 1. And it opens up with, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Wow. Wow. Everybody's heard of the cedars of Lebanon. They were the legendary cedars that were, of course, associated with the temple. Lebanon, of course, is north of Israel. And it takes its name. The word Lebanon means the white one, incidentally. From the snow-covered mountains that surround it. And uh, since the cedars of Lebanon uh, furnished the timber for the temple, 
It is thus addressed. And this is also the ancient rabbinical view of, the, of this portion of the passage. It has a temple overtone. But the passage goes on, verse 2, Howl for a tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl, ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage has come down. Now, Bashan was known for its oak trees. But that really isn't the point. Bashan was to the north, but east of the Jordan. Now, something you should sort of understand is this is typically the path between Lebanon and Bashan where enemies always attacked Israel. That's why even though as you look at a map, you think of some of the enemies of Israel, like Syria and like Babylon, whatever, to the east, they actually came down from the north because of the topography there. So uh, that's always the way they were. Now, Bashan is uh, north of Israel, uh, in, in the north part of Israel, east of the Jordan River. You and I would think of that by a more modern name called the Golan. Has that been in the news lately? We might pay attention. Okay. God's judgment fell upon Israel in 70 AD from the north. When the Romans came through, they were no different than the other enemies. They followed pretty much the same path. Verse 3. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds, for their glory is spoiled. A voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. So now we have another geographic area, namely Jordan. Now, south of the uh, Sea of Galilee, uh, even today it's quite lush, but in the old days it was very lush, and that was also the lair for lions. And you can find uh, verses of that in uh, Jeremiah 50, 44, and other places that make allusions. The thickets along the uh, banks of the Jordan, south of the Sea of Galilee, were known. The young lions, or kefirim, uh, were weaned and began to raven and to satisfy a uh, insatiable appetite. So, and there's a number of passages that allude to that. Lebanon, Bashan, and Jordan are thus poetically, idiomatically indicative of the whole land, but from the area that the enemies would come. Now, incidentally, the verb for destroy, the passive intensive jadad, is used three times in these couple of verses. And the wailing or the howling, twice as an imperative and once as a noun, again three times. And the interjectional idea of listen is very vivid, is very poetic kind of writing. They all speak to the severity and the reality and the suffering of the coming judgment. You know, listen to the howling. The whole style is, is, is uh, unusual for Zechariah, not uncommon for some of the other prophets. It's a very lofty kind of language, but very, very descriptive. The first three verses are very much poetic, probably the most poetic part of the entire book. But going on, verse 4, Thus saith the Lord God, feed, or more precisely tend, uh, the flock of the slaughter. We're supposed to tend God's sheep, but here he's saying you tend them for the, these are the flock of the slaughter. You see, again, we have this whole uh, cloud over here. As we go forward in this chapter, you're going to to see instructions uh, to Zechariah. He acts in the first person singular. But it's quite clear from the passage that he is called upon to act out representatively what will apply to the Messiah. You remember Ezekiel did this in his uh, prophets. He often had to act something out to get a message across. And it's something similar going on. We saw that earlier in the book when after the night visions where we had the crowning of the high priest. The high priest isn't supposed to be crowned, but there was a ceremonial episode that wasn't a vision. It was something that Zechariah was supposed to do to communicate that. You may recall that earlier. In any case... Uh, we have here this intention to tend or feed the, the flock of the slaughter. Uh, is it, strangely enough, will turn out to be a commission to the Son of God uh, by the Father. The Messiah is given the task of feeding or tending uh, the flock of the slaughter. The word ra'a is a, a term meaning to pasture, tend, graze, or feed. So it's not just feed like food. It's a tend of it. Uh, remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. When you read through that, you get the sense of what the role of the shepherd was supposed to be. And I'm always intrigued. Uh, another commentator's pointed out ra'a is, is almost uh, sounds just like ruach, which is the spirit, which is the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. is the ruach Elohim. The word is not linked by root, but it is linked by sound, strangely enough. But anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the whole idea is to, that they are, he is to tend the flock that is destined for butchering. So it's a lofty language, but heavy in its tone as it develops. Verse 5. Whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty. They that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. And their own shepherds pity them not. 
Now, in this case, this is not alluding to the Roman conquerors. This is alluding to uh, their own. And uh, there's untold suffering ahead. This is terrifying. And their own unprincipled teachers and rulers is what's in view here. While on the one hand, uh, they're claiming piety, it's in barefaced hypocrisy. And as you may know from the, having studied the background of the leadership, the Jewish leadership of the day of the gospel period, it was full of avarice and greed. The scandals by Ananias and the, you know, the, the, the priestly functions were scandal. That's why Jesus drove them out with money changes. I won't spend our time tonight getting into all of that, but those of you that have done your gospel homework recognize that that was a time of incredible corruption among the leadership. Now, there's a strange structure here. There are plural nouns used with singular predicates, which is opposite to the grammatical agreement, but it's a kind of construction that is incredibly emphatic. But we'll continue here. Verse 6. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. But lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand and the hand of his king. And they shall smite the land, and out of their land I will not deliver them. Boy, this is so antithetical to what you hear all through so many passages. Where even though you're under attack, I'll deliver you and so forth. God is saying just the opposite. That's very, very strange as we're going to discover as we go here. Because God had made all kinds of commitments. They were not unconditional commitments. Now, some of the things we talk about are unconditional covenants. We're not dealing with that here. Where God said if they're in obedience, that he would protect them. But this is, we've gotten to a point where God is backing off. He's removing restraint. And we're dealing here with some disastrous conquests and so forth that are different than the ones in history. These people have been badgered by the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks. When the Romans came, something else is going on here, something quite different we'll get into. But it's interesting that, uh, and into the hand of his king, everyone into his king, who is, is their king? Do you remember John 19.15 where they say, We have no king but Caesar. What an amazing declaration for the Jewish leadership. Under the heel of Rome, they chafed and rebelled and never really accepted Roman leadership. The whole history of the Roman Congress of Judea is one of headaches for the Romans. In fact, they finally plowed the in, in, the 130, in 135 AD, they plowed the whole city under. They gave up trying to rule the country as long as there was a Jewish presence. It was always a headache. And yet there was one occasion, only one that we're aware of, where the leadership proclaimed, we have no king but Caesar. Very Roman kind of declaration. When was that? The day that Jesus was crucified. Said, Shall I crucify your king? Remember? We have no king but Caesar. Well, they rejected the Messiah, and the, Messiah, the Lord God is going to reject them, as you'll see in a minute. And uh, this is, so it turns out, as you examine this, this remar- with remarkable accuracy portrays the Roman invasion and the disasters of the late 1st and the 2nd centuries in the land. Because obviously uh, it was 32 AD when, they, when Jesus was crucified. Within 38 years, Jerusalem fell. And then uh, it wasn't much longer. It was, that was in 70 AD, and it was about 50, years, 50 or 60 years later that Bar Kokhba had a revolt. They took three years, but they crushed that. But by then they'd come to the conclusion they could never rule this land as long as there's any Jewish presence. And they plowed under, not just the temple, the whole city, and built a, a new city on top of it, Aila Capilina. When the Romans set siege to Jerusalem in 70 AD, that's when they tore down all the trees in the land to provide siege material. And they, uh, uh, it went on a better part of a year. 1,100,000 Jews perished in the, in the war itself, in the fall of Jerusalem. And a half a million more died during the course of the war and the siege, in addition to them. And then, of course, after that, we get into the whole period of, of the, what we call the diaspora, scattered throughout the world. And then we find, as, as, as the history goes on, we get to the days of the Ottoman Empire, where for centuries the land is abandoned, becomes marshland, gets destroyed, and uh, so forth. It's a strange tragedy. This was the people of God. This was the people that went down to Egypt as a family and came out as a nation. This was the people that were set apart at Sinai with a special covenant. This was the people that had the benefit of these, this whole history of God's private, special, unique dealing with them. 
And something strange is going on here. God is standing back. He's stepping back. Verse 7. I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bands. And I fed the flock. Now, the, the, the two staves doesn't ring familiar because we've got some vocabulary problems, perhaps. But I want you to think for a moment of Psalm 23, verse 4. Speaking of the shepherd, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. See, part of our problem is we don't know much about shepherding. The rod and the staff were there uh, to protect the sheep in a twofold manner. One danger was the outward enemies, and the other one was their own internal strife or problems. And so the word translated beauty here, grace or graciousness or pleasantness, is the word uh, neom, and it's, uh, it's uh, theom, rather. It is the same root from which we get the word Naomi. Remember in the book of Ruth, her name meant pleasantness. And uh, you can consider this label as fitting the shepherd's crook, which is used to keep the sheep in line. It's a gentle prod. It's a gentle way to keep things orderly for the shepherd. And uh, you've probably heard the remark that if you've ever seen a shepherd's crook, it gives rise to the remark that on the top of every staff there's a crook. But that doesn't mean anything. Okay. <laughs> Bad. I know. Okay. So the shepherd carried two things. He carried the shepherd's crook to manage the sheep, with, but he also carried what you and I might call a club, a rod. And uh, the word here is the word bands. And uh, it comes from uh, hobelem, which means to hobble or bind or pledge. It's a term that actually alludes to a covenant, strangely enough. But uh, the shepherds were used to carrying a heavy stick used to fight off wild animals uh, and, and also to fight off anyone that might try to steal the sheep. So he, he really carried two things, a rod and a staff. They're different. Follow me? And that's what the beauty and the bands uh, are analogous to. And so we have here the shepherd, the good shepherd, with his tools, which he's going to allude to in a little bit. Now, verse 8 is the most troublesome verse in the entire chapter. It says, Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. There are no less than 40 different theories as to who these three guys are. And let me tell you, without wading you through them, none of them are convincing. Okay? And so uh, you say, what are you going to do with that? Well, um, hang in there. Um, I think in part what may throw many people is the, uh, the fact that it all occurs in one month. And um, I think that part of what's probably going on here, if you understand the rest of the passage... What he's dealing with are three of the key national leaders that were involved in the rejection of Jesus Christ on that fateful 14th of Nisan in 32 AD. So this this leadership rejected the national uh, Messiah and sealed the fate of the Jewish state. They rejected him, so he's rejecting them. See, what we'll discover if we study the scriptures, God had made an agreement, call it a covenant if you will, with the peoples of the earth with respect uh, to his own people Israel. He placed them, that is the Gentiles, under restraint, lest they cause harm to Israel. And uh, you'll find that in a number of verses, and I'll list all those in the notes that go with the tape. But the point is, when this restraint that God had placed on the Gentile nations was removed, the Romans destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Now it's interesting, if you go back through history, Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, or um, Pompey, the Roman conqueror of Judea, none of these were allowed to mar Israel's national existence. They all caused problems. I mean, they were suffering and there was tension, but the point is none of them were allowed to destroy the nation in a corporate sense. But when the Messiah broke his staff, remember the staff part was to keep order within the, in the flock, right? Neither Titus nor his generals could spare the temple. They didn't want to destroy the temple. It burned by an inadvertent accident. 
and they had to take it apart to get the gold. That wasn't the plan. And later, Julian the Apostate tried to reconstruct the temple. They got nowhere. So on the one hand, previous conquerors couldn't mar the Jewish state. Subsequent events could not restore it. Now, to get a feeling for that, turn with me to Luke 19. This is by way of review because we've looked at this before. Turn to um, Luke uh, chapter 19. And let's refresh our memory what happened that fateful Palm Sunday. You all know how uh, he rode the donkey in and they said, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Thy king cometh unto thee. And so we've been through all that. But in verse 41, it says, When he was come near, that he came over the Mount of Olives on the donkeys, going down towards the uh, Kedron Valley. It says, He beheld the city and he wept over it. He knew what was coming. With my tongue in my cheek, I'll say, He read Zechariah chapter 11. Okay. He said, saying, verse 42, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. Wow. For they shall come upon thee, that the enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Tragedy of tragedies. And uh, now it's interesting that they're blinded. How long are they blinded? Romans 11.25 tells you, Israel is blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. When the church is complete, that ends that period. It ends the time that they're set aside. It ends the time that that, uh, God has backed away and puts them back center stage, if you will. But um, something else that you might want to just pick up. In Luke 21, verse 24, it's another key verse you might want to mark. Where Jesus says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. They don't confuse the times of the Gentiles with the fullness of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles is that period of history of the earth where the Gentiles are dominant. It started with Nebuchadnezzar, as far as Israel is concerned. It started with Nebuchadnezzar, and it'll finish with the end of the Antichrist. But uh, the fullness of the Gentiles is a term used of the church. Different. One's a fullness of the number. The other one is a period of time. They're slightly different. They mean slightly different things. So don't get those confused. Anyway, let's move back to Zechariah 11, verse 9. Then said I... I will not feed you. That that dieth, let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. Boy, you got that's exactly right. Who is right? Remember even the words of Malachi, we're going through Malachi, that the false leadership in Israel. He described their stinginess that even in offerings, they're supposed to offer blemish-free calf, and they'd offer one that's about to die sick anyway to sort of cover the detail. In other words, they, they did the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it. In other words, they were giving the worst, not the best. And so rather than give sickly offerings, that which is going to die, let it die. It's a back of the hand. It's a rejection of that kind of nonsense. And incidentally, if this verse shocks you, I should mention to you, if you read the, the recounts of an eyewitness to the fall of Jerusalem, Josephus records that not only famine, but cannibalism was rampant in the siege of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And uh, for those of you that have a copy of Wars of the Jews by Josephus, uh, it's in there. And uh, this is also alluded to in Deuteronomy 28. And so you might, there's several verses, but let's just take one. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 6 and get a glimpse of uh, the Old Testament, you know, focuses on this in several ways, this kind of thing in several ways. And... uh, there's similar things, in, just to give you a parallel passage that you can study at your leisure. In the, uh, Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 12, He that is far off shall die of the pestilence, and he that is near shall fall by the sword. And he that remaineth and is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus will I accomplish my fury upon them. Boy, uh, tough stuff. Tough stuff. So what we're seeing here in this, in this sweep, you see is that the shepherd, the good shepherd, is withdrawing from his traditional care of the sheep. They are disowned 
and disclaimed by the good shepherd, and thus the sheep are exposed to the destruction by their enemies. Now, by the way, don't misunderstand me. That's not permanent. That's a temporary thing. That's the good news. You may recall when you study Hosea chapter 2. Well, in fact, the whole book of Isaiah focuses on this issue. There will be a day, Hosea predicts, where they're not my people. He names his children. I mean, not my people. But the good news in Hosea is the day will come when he will take them up again. And that helps perhaps to put in perspective the strange events that are going on even today. And uh, they're all laid out in advance, and we're going to be looking at that. Verse 10. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder. Chopped it to pieces, as we would say it. That I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. Now the word here is berith, or agreement. It comes from the root barak, which is to cut up, as you might cut up sacrificing animals to seal a contract. You remember that that occurs in Genesis 15 where God makes the covenant with Abraham towards the land. Now the covenant with Abraham was an unusual one because it's a one-party covenant. Normally two people making a contract would take a sacrifice, cut it in two, and the two people making the deal would walk between them to seal the deal. What God does in Genesis 15, he puts Abraham in deep sleep and God alone as a flaming fire passes between the pieces. The point he's making is that it's a one-sided covenant. Abraham had nothing to perform. It was a one-way deal, all into his favor. Very key point. Another thing that's analogous to this sort of is when you eat a banquet together to seal some kind of a friendship. We see that in Genesis 31, verse 54, as an example. What we're saying here, see, this, is, this agreement is not an unconditional one, and they have not performed. So God is, in effect, tearing up the contract. He breaks the, the band's element of this to pieces. And his, God's grace and mercy are being withdrawn. That's a tough idea for you and I to grab because we, we take so much for granted the uniqueness of the New Testament. You see, his promises to them had been conditioned upon obedience. And by the way, I want to emphasize one more time that the unconditional aspects are not in view here. It's a whole other thing. There's a different covenants and a whole other discussion. Here we're dealing with the divine restraint upon the nations preventing the decimation of Israel. That's what's being withdrawn. And uh, this holding in check of the forces inimical to Israel is spoken under the figure of a covenant in Job 5.23, Hosea 2, verses 18 through 20, roughly, and Ezekiel 34 and other places. Now, as we study this and as we begin to recognize, here's Israel. God's chosen. They rejected the Messiah, so God is removing his restraint. Heavy stuff. When we consider that, let me remind you of something else that's disturbing. You and I are called to holiness. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not counteracting grace, because the grace we enjoy is something very special, very unique. In fact, that's the point. It's different than the grace in the Old Testament in many ways. And yet, it's interesting how we, as New Testament Christians, our first difficulty in understanding the Bible is to really comprehend the grace of God that's available in Jesus Christ. Staggering. But as we comprehend that, as we apprehend that in our lives, there's a strange thing that happens. The pendulum, as in a sense, swings too far the other way. Many of us are guilty of what some people would call abusive grace. I just got back from a 700 pastors attended the International Pastors Conference, and the theme of the conference was holiness. Great conference, wonderful messages. But it was fascinating to me how many times, I had over a dozen speakers, and how many times the speakers would literally, I, I, I'm tempted to go and make a, a tally of how often the speakers during that conference made a remark like this. I don't want to sound legalistic, but... You understand what I'm saying? See, I, I think the theme could be summarized. We seem to have swung too far towards irresponsibility. We have somehow embraced grace but failed to understand the fear of God. God expects us to be obedient. Now, will that will be flawless? No, no, no. Don't misunderstand me. And I'm not talking about the externals. That's the trap we always fall into. We love to put form over substance. No, no. But even in terms of our heart, even in terms of our, especially in terms of our walk, there is a thing called holiness that we should be growing toward. So as we sit here and look at the plight of the nation Israel, as God 
reduces his re- the restraint on, the, on their enemies and to allow them to not just be sufferers and so forth they do throughout history, but to be actually decimated as a nation. Staggering. And for the better part of 2,000 years, there was no state of Israel. Staggering. But all the more reason that we take biblical significance in the reestablishment of the state of Israel in 1948. Biblically, that's staggering. Not that they're yet, there yet, but the point is God is positioning a whole change of some kind. Now, the change is not what a lot of people think it is. It's going to get still going to get kind of rough. But going on, verse 11. And it was broken, or annulled, maybe a better term. That is the agreement. In that day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. So we have, if you will, this restraint. You say, gee, Chuck, that sounds pretty weird stuff. I haven't really uh, seen things that way. Well, turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 23. Tough chapter. You might mark in your notes to read the whole chapter at your next opportunity to sort of underscore the lesson tonight. But we'll just skim through it quickly to get the flavor of it. I want you to visualize Jesus. I want you to notice his diplomacy towards the leadership of his day. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, wherever they bid you observe, that that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. I'm sure that they're sitting back there impressed with this sermon, huh? For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But of all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the uppermost places in the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And on he goes, on he goes. I won't uh, take the whole thing. He then, starting verse 13, pronounces seven woes or alasses or oye, you know, in the, in the, in the Hebrew. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, and ye neither go in yourselves, neither permit them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore ye shall receive, what? The greater damnation. And he just goes on like this. Heavy, heavy stuff. And uh, he goes through all these woes, and uh, in the interest of time, I think, well, let's see, we've got time. Let's, just, let's go through this. Where was I? Let's just go ahead. Verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. Boy. Woe unto you blind guides who say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, which is greater, the gold of the temple or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gift that is upon it, he is bound. Ye fools and blind, which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things on it. Whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth in it. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him who sitteth on it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. O ye blind guides, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. And he goes on like this, and we could spend time. Let's skim to verse 36. After going through, hammering away one thing after another. Verse 36, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. See, that all sorts of, that ties us comfortably, I think, to Zechariah 11, but let's move to verse 37. The next three verses are interesting verses because they summarize all of history. All of history. We have the purpose of all history. Then we have the tragedy of all history. And then we have the triumph of all history in these three verses. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them who are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, 
even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. That's the purpose of all history, for God to gather his own. But then we have a phrase that is the tragedy of their history. Angie would not. And that's what Zechariah has in focus, as you'll see when we return to Zechariah 11. But it's, He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. The shepherd that's been protecting them through their history is standing back. But it doesn't end there, fortunately. Verse 39, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Interesting. Well, back to Zechariah 11. See, the willing heart, then as now, perceived the truth and the intent of God through his servants. You see, you notice that it said, the, the, the verse, uh, previous verse ended, So the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. There was a faithful core group, the remnant, as we like to call it. And by the way, this emphasis, it's interesting, uh, in the previous verse, it was broken in all the day. So the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. It's interesting that his faithful don't hope or believe. They know that this is the word of God. This is one reason that I have had a tendency in my later biblical career, in a sense, is to regard apologetics as a waste of time. A lot of people are upset with me about that. I'm not saying apologetics is a waste of time because the Scripture tells you you should be ready to give every man an answer of the hope that is within you with all meekness and fear. But I don't think debating, I don't think arguing is constructive. I think it's a waste of time. We do not need to prove that the Bible is true. It can take care of itself. It's sort of like the lion in the cage. You know, he doesn't need you to defend you. All you have to do is open the cage. He'll take care of himself. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, moving on. Again, I want to emphasize in the Hebrew style, often the effect is mentioned first and then the cause. That's a pattern in Hebrew literature, often in Hebrew literature. And that's exactly, we have uh, gone through now a number of uh, verses, uh, first 11 verses that paint, when you look at it carefully, a terrifying picture. That the land is in desolation, that the good shepherd is standing back. He's annulling his agreement to protect them. He's letting their enemies mar them to make them desolate. And you wonder, okay, wow, what is it that has led to this gloomy, dark portrait? Then you encounter verse 12. Wow, what an interesting verse. Here's the good shepherd saying, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. Or as we might say, if not, don't bother. So they weighed for my price. Thirty pieces of silver. What a remarkable passage that was written five centuries before Christ was born. Interesting. He said, I said, if you think good, give me my price, if not forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Hold your place here, because we believe it or not, we will return. But you might turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them what will you give me and I will deliver him unto you and they bargained with him for what? 30 pieces of silver and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him you all know the story what many people don't realize is the plan was that they, he would not do this on a feast day not when there's a crowd, not when there could be an uprising, not, we're be, not on a feast day. That's expressed in the Gospels. What many people don't realize is at the, that what we call the, the Last Supper, when Jesus announces the betrayal, what's he doing? He's announcing the betrayal. What the Lord is doing is seizing the initiative. The cat is out of the bag. What in effect he's saying, you either do it now or you don't. 
Judas had to split and get his benefactors. Hey, guys, we're in trouble. It's not a secret. He knows we're coming. We've got to do it tonight or it's over, is the presumption. What's happening is Jesus, when you study that night, from Gethsemane on to the cross where he gives up the Spirit, you'll discover if you study carefully, Jesus is in charge of every detail. It's his initiative that sets the timing. It had to be on, uh, uh, on the day appointed. He had to rise from the dead on the third day later to be on the anniversary when the ark of Noah came to rest in, Gen- in Genesis 8-4. It's all tied to, a, to God's plan. And all the way through, Jesus and in the garden, in Hoopsiki, Jesus of Nazareth. And they're, they're nailed when he, speaks, when he announces who he is, I am. And uh, he doesn't let them up until they agree. If you seek me, let these go their way. They came with 600 guys. They're going to arrest them all. No, no. You don't, if you seek me, let them go your way. Before they tied his hands, he tied theirs. The, study the whole thing. It's a fascinating study. But we'll move on. It's interesting, 30 pieces of silver. We discover from Exodus 21, 32 that that's the price of a gourd slave. That's the price of a gourd slave. A freeman was worth more than twice that. Discounted goods, it would seem. Now, it fascinates me because if you read uh, Exodus 21, 32, you'll discover not only is that the price of a slave that's been gored by an ox, but the ox was instructed to be stoned. And the world that crucified Christ is destined to be stoned. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 21, one of the climactic judgments in the book of Revelation is the hailstones falling upon the earth. 100-pound hailstones, if you can imagine. Heavy stuff. But it's interesting to me. I, don't think, I, I, I really think the Holy Spirit is indulging what you and I might call a pun. The final judgment is being stoned. It's interesting to me. Anyway, verse 13. We're not through with this little passage. 30 pieces of silver. Look at verse 13. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter. A fancy price, a goodly price, that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver. And I cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. How interesting. Now, on the one hand, Zechariah is told to act this out in some way. But obviously, our interest isn't the mechanics. The message echoes, of course, Matthew again. You might take a look at Matthew chapter 27, a little following from where we read last. And starting about verse 3. Then Judas, who had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented. And that is an easily misunderstood word. I don't think he repented in the spiritual sense. He regretted what he had done, would be maybe more precise. And brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. It's interesting that blood in the Bible is always linked to silver. In the Torah, the redemption money was always silver. It's interesting that the tabernacle, the fence, the outside parts, sat on brass, bronze, in the ground. But the tabernacle itself, which speaks of Jesus Christ, rested on what? Silver sockets. It rested on what? Levitical symbols of what? The blood. What do you and I rest on? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. Blood and silver are always linked up idiomatically in the scripture. And it's interesting, here, even here, Judas links silver with his blood. I betrayed innocent blood. You know, that thing is just fascinating. Because we have the testimony of Satan's own man proclaiming Jesus' innocence. Interesting. Behold, I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver, where? Verse 5, in the temple. And he departed. And what did he do? He went and hanged himself. Now they got a problem. They're standing, the priests are standing there. He's come back, said, trying to undo the, you know, I betrayed innocent blood. He said, that's your problem, fella. So he dumps it on the floor, runs out and hangs himself. They're sitting there looking at these 30 pieces of silver. They got a problem. It's too valuable to ignore. They can't put it in the treasury because the Torah forbids tainted money to be put in the treasury. There's a whole passage of that in Deuteronomy 23. 
But you see, they had CPAs in their day too. We can't put it in the treasury, but what we can do is prepay a forthcoming expense. The temple had a burden that if strangers died in the area, it was the temple's responsibility to bury them. If there was a next of kin, the next of kin was responsible, even a criminal, the next of kin had to take the body and take care of it. That's why Joseph and Nicodemus pick up the body of Jesus Christ at the crucifixion. Joseph, Joseph apparently was the next of kin, among other things. But the point is, what if, somebody, what if a stranger dies in town? No one knows where he came from. There he is. He's dead. Whose problem is that? It's the temples. So it worked. So one of their headaches financially was they had to, this was a burden. They had to, bury, they had to buy a place to put this guy, bury him. So knowing that, here's this money. We can't put it in the treasury, but we can go buy a field. So when these guys pass away, as nothing's more certain than death and contributions to the Democratic National Committee. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just was working. So the point is they could anticipate an expense by buying the pot. And what do they do? It's interesting. He said, it is not lawful to put them in the treasury. Verse 6, the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel. That means checking with their tax advisors, whatever. And bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. So the first point I want you to notice is that this is not a Chuck Missler contrivance. The linkage of this event to Old Testament prophecy is declared by Matthew. You with me? There's a problem I'm coming to. I know what you're, I'm sure, bothering. But let's, let's first get the, the basics in here. This passage in Zechariah, chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, is one of the most remarkable in the Old Testament. Notice, it has the price of the transaction, 30 pieces of silver. It has the site of the transaction, the house of the Lord, the temple. It has the ultimate recipient of the money. It was what? A potter. When he sold the field, where did the money finally end up? Temple floor to the temple, the hands of the executives, and then they bought a field, and who ends up with the money? Potter. And what is the nature of the transaction? The purchase of blood. Now, one of the things, one of the, and the libraries are full of scholastic attempts to try to understand, Matthew apparently made a mistake. <gasps> Are there mistakes? No, but that's what some competent scholars, that's one of the ways you try to explain this, because we all notice here, the passage, there is a passage that alludes to this in Jeremiah 18, first four verses, but that really doesn't solve the problem. Matthew is quoting, he claims, from Jeremiah. Now, there's one thing I noticed that I haven't seen anyone else. Uh, it's in verse 9, Matthew says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah. And yet it's recorded in Zechariah. So it wouldn't surprise me in my peculiar turn of mind that maybe Jeremiah spoke it, but Zechariah also recorded it. That's perfectly, I'm comfortable with that, but that doesn't satisfy most scholars. There's another issue that's much simpler, actually. It turns out, we know from Talmudic evidence and other evidences, that in Jesus' day, the prophets were, of course, in scrolls. And the first prophet in the scroll of the prophets was Jeremiah. Their order of books was a little different than ours. So the scroll of Jeremiah would have more than Jeremiah. It had also, it had Zechariah in the scroll. And so that was a way that they alluded to it. And uh, there was Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the rest, and so forth. So it was designated by the name of the first book in the series. Now, incidentally, this occurs in Luke 24, verse 44, where Jesus speaks of the Psalms, but what he means by that from the context is the whole third division the Tanakh, the Old Testament, is divided into three parts. Okay? And the third part was the Psalms and the other writings. So there's, the point is they're in three parts. And the word Psalms is used for the third part there in the context. So that usage, that style of expression, is evident elsewhere in the Scripture. So I don't think it's a big deal, but you should be aware of it. Some people are really troubled by the fact that, gee, Matthew said it was Jeremiah and the prophecies in Zechariah. Well, Zechariah is part of that scroll, is the easy answer. And that seems to be accepted by most of the, the scholars. 
I mean, you got a lot of degrees behind your name, and you got time in your hands. You find things like this to argue about, and so forth. But, but I don't think it's—I don't think it's material. Turning back to Zechariah 11, verse 14. So we have—we have certainly in uh, verse 12 and 13 the rejection of Jesus Christ in view. Verse 14. Then I cut asunder my other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Strange verse. Strange verse. You see, one of the instruments was the issue of the external enemies, but the other one was the the issue of the internal dissension. And here he cut asunder, cut into pieces, the other of the two tools, the shepherd, which implies that he severed the relationships uh, within the country between Judah and Israel. And it's interesting, if you study the fall of Jerusalem, you you study that whole period, one of the great disasters that led to the whole downfall of Judea was their internal dissensions, fighting among themselves. And uh, the the internal strife and divisions contributed heavily. And this Antitus, Vespasian, was going to ultimately scatter them throughout the world. He initiates what you and I would call the diaspora. It's interesting that the first half preceded but the breaking of the second staff succeeded in, in accomplishing it. Now, as I, we looked shortly, the, they're temporarily blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, what's fascinating to me is between verses 14 and 15 occur the entire history of the present period. You say, boy, that's kind of wild, except that occurs again and again and again in the Scripture. And let me give you an example of that. And this is... By way of review, well, let me just summarize because we've been through this before. But in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21, when Jesus opens his ministry, he reads from the scroll of Isaiah what we call Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. And he goes through all these things that he does. Then he gets to a point where he closes the book and, and announces to them, This day is that scripture fulfilled in your ears. Wow, that's his mandate. His ministry starts. But when you go back and look at Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and compare it to what he read, you discover something very strange. He didn't finish verse 2. He read up until what we call a comma. The part that he did not read is, and the day of vengeance of our God. He stopped at the comma, shut the book, and said, this day is that scripture fulfilled in your ears. Aren't you glad he stopped at the comma? See, the guy that is the kinsman redeemer also is the avenger of blood, if you understand the Torah. And that other role is one yet to be fulfilled. Is he going to fulfill that role? Absolutely. And that's what's forthcoming. Now, that comma has already lasted. You always, you know, people in school tell us a comma is the time you pause, right? Well, that pause has lasted 2,000 years. Now, let's move on, because we're coming, in many respects, to a climax uh, in the book of Zechariah. We've got the terrible tyrant emerging here. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet again the instruments of a foolish shepherd. There's going to be a very specific, false, terrible shepherd on the horizon. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 43? In John 5, 43, Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Interesting passage. And I believe that person is in view in the forthcoming several verses. Now, one of the things I might mention, when he says the foolish shepherd, that doesn't ring... Uh, real to us because we use the term foolish a little differently than the way the Bible does. We think a foolish is someone who's stupid or not too bright or does something silly. It's sort of our notion. If you study carefully the Old Testament use of that term, someone who is foolish is someone who has moral failure. Someone who's foolish. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In other words, the, the term foolish has a much graver, somber connotation. Now, what's interesting about the coming verses, I believe the world is getting ready to welcome a leader that has the answers. 
And some Bible experts that study this and talk about it, like Hal Lindsey and Dave Hunt and others, they believe when this coming world leader surfaces, he might even be an alien or have an alien connection. Now, I mention it not because they're right, but I want to stretch your horizon not to think of, gee, some kind of political leader. Could it be X, Y, or Z? You always hear people conjecturing. That's a waste of time for lots of reasons. I don't think it'll be revealed until after the rapture. But I do want you to broaden your horizon as to what we're talking about. This guy is going to do lying signs and wonders. He's going to call down fire from heaven. He's going to raise people from the dead, apparently, namely himself. We're not prepared for the strangeness that's coming. Now, it's interesting. Israel rejected the Messiah, so God rejected them for a time. It's interesting that the world today regards biblical Christians as a reactionary element that's standing in the way. The world yearns to get the Christians out of their hair. I got news for them. God is going to give them what they want. God removed the restraint on the Gentile nations regarding Israel. And you've seen the result of the last 2,000 years. God is going to remove the restraint of the restrainer on the earth. And I don't think the earth has any conception of how strange it's going to get. I think the restrainer is restraining far more today than we have any idea. What is he restraining? Sin? Hardly. If the Holy Spirit is restraining sin, he's doing a poor job. Look around. No, he's restraining the mystery of iniquity, whatever that means. The mystery of iniquity. I think the UFOs and some of the strange stuff we see glimpses of are going to be coming down in spades right after the rapture. I think the weirdness that we experience by reading Revelation 6 through 19, the expansion of the 70th week of Daniel, is so weird because we assume it's symbolic. It may not be. Some of that may be far more literal than we have any idea. But I'm getting off the subject. Let's keep moving here. For background on this guy, you all have your notes and studies, but Daniel 11, verses 36 through 39 details him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, first dozen verses talk about him. Revelation 13 talks about two guys. And people, take your pick. There's two. Remember, it's a duet, not one guy. But anyway... And you can also make a list of passages that he is the opposite of what he should be. But that's a study that we'll just defer to our notes. I personally believe for reasons that may not be correct and you may not agree with, but let me just say it anyway. I believe that he will not be revealed until after the rapture. And I say that because you and I have no business looking to him. We should be looking at for Jesus Christ. And all these conjectures and you see videos and newsletters and stuff that it's this guy or that guy. Wait, it's a waste of time, I believe. Because I don't think he'll be revealed until after the rapture. But the times do seem ripe for his appearing. But let's go on to verse 16, which speaks of his work. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which will not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Now I want you to notice the contrast between him and the good shepherd. He will feed on the sheep rather than feed them. And then we've got verse 17, which to me is one of the most fascinating verses, most overlooked verses in the Old Testament. Everybody likes to talk about the Antichrist. And yet no one notices that there is a physical description of him in the scripture, I believe. Now, not everybody agrees with me, so I could very well be an error here, but I share it for you to stir you up to do your own homework. Take a look at it. Verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd. I-D-O-L. Idle like a false worship. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. That's interesting. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Woe to the idle shepherd, or it, it, oy is the term actually in the Hebrew, onomata poetic uh, uh, interjection, commonly used in laments. You find that in uh, thing, alas, alas, that kind of, or oy, oy in the Hebrew. It's an interjection, as they call it. And it, of course, hints of the coming judgment. But now it's an idle shepherd, I-D-O-L. Not idle like being lazy, I-D-O-L, like a false god. An idle shepherd. And uh, so this coming world, that's what 2 Thessalonians 2, among other passages, dramatized so forcefully. He will enforce the covenant. What covenant? It's conjecture. He doesn't sign a treaty. He enforces a covenant. Daniel 9, 27. 
Now, in the first part of us, that'll start a seven-year period. In the first part of that period, Israel thinks they've got the millennium. They've got peace, finally. They finally have peace. I think all the stuff that's going on right now is not a prelude to that. Setting the stage, maybe. Don't confuse them. But midway in the seven-year period, he will become so powerful that he sets himself up to be worshipped. The abomination of desolation, all of that. And that's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 10 about, right, in that area. Now, this question of description, we got this arm and this right eye business. See, I personally regard these as being very specific. And because they're so specific, I hesitate to look at them uh, figuratively or symbolically. Some people do, some commentators do, and they... See, the fact that they're dried up or shriveled. We find that same word in 1 Kings 13.4 of, of a leper. And uh, his eye darkened. That's kaha. It means to grow dim, faint, or blind. And um, I believe that these are physical descriptions of the Antichrist. Now, in Revelation chapter 13, three different times it makes reference to the fact that he is going to receive a head wound and be regarded as dead. And comes back to life. And the whole world is amazed that he's come back to life. Now, some people believe it's a real coming back from the dead. Others point out that only Jesus has the keys of hell and of death. So they argue that's a counterfeit. Boy, I've seen some academic arguments in my time, and that's one of them. It is so perfect it fools everybody. So who cares whether it's, you know, you see what I'm saying? As far as the world's concerned, he died. Everybody knows it. That's why they're amazed when he comes back. Except it's interesting. I wonder if this head wound that he apparently recovers from ultimately, he comes back to life. I wonder, a conjecture, if it leaves one arm shriveled and one eye darkened. And if that's the case, that's what Zechariah 11.17 at least suggests. If that's the case... That gives me a whole other perspective. See, if he's apparently come back from the dead, but he's got this lingering evidence of his assault, whatever it was that caused him to to be dead. I wonder if that's the reason that his followers, when they take upon themselves the sign, his name, or his number of his name, they take it on their forehead or their hand. As a form of identity with him. Do you follow what I'm saying? Just a speculation. But I leave it to you to think about and look at it. And that I think Zechariah is so precise in chapter 11 with the 30 pieces of silver on the temple floor to the pot, you know, all of that. I have a high respect for Zechariah, I have a high respect for the Word of God. But Zechariah certainly is going to be called for precision. And we're going to see some other exciting precisions in subsequent chapters that can blow you away. But here we are, Zechariah is suddenly getting very crisp, very clear, and about, not things of the past that have been filled out, about coming. It's coming, you know, it's around the corner somewhere. Now, it's interesting, this whole chapter, of course, is paving the way for chapter 12. And uh, in chapter 12, we're going to have, in that day, 17 times. We're going to have Jerusalem mentioned 22 times. We'll have the nations mentioned uh, 13 times. And it's going to be exciting as we go. But I, I'm indebted to um, a NASA astronaut that I was talking to recently, a gal, Sharon Bodine. Uh, she was the NASA astronaut that was scheduled to be on the Challenger but caught a cold or something, so they had to switch, and a school teacher got put in her place, and it blew up on the pad, as you recall. God had other things for her to do. And she runs around the country giving talks for Christ. But she has an interesting thing. As she talks to the women, she says, You know, we should not be looking for the Antichrist. Everybody's all hung up with the Antichrist. We shouldn't be looking for him. We shouldn't be worried about the tribulation. So what if there is a guillotine right outside our front door? Who cares? What we should be looking for is the marriage supper of the Lamb. We shouldn't be asking questions about 666 and all that stuff. The kind of questions we should be asking, do they serve seconds? I wonder who I'll be sitting next to. What shall I wear? You know, the whole bit. You know, she has this little thesis. But you know, and she's sort of kidding around, but she's right. We should keep focusing on the glorious hope. We do not look for the Antichrist. I don't believe we have any business doing that. I think we're out here. We're going to watch this whole scene from the mezzanine. Now, just to wrap it up, Jesus 
has been working in the potter's field for a long time now. He purchased it. The whole world. And he paid a lot more than 30 pieces of silver for the field that he's working in. And he did pay for it with the price of blood. His blood. Now, by the way, he bought the whole field filled with broken lives. Broken physically. Broken financially. Broken mentally. Broken morally. The great potter takes the clay that should be thrown away and through the wheel of circumstance shapes it into a vessel of honor. If we let him. Because God is sovereign, but there's a frightening gift that he's given you and I. A terrifying gift. That's our sovereignty. With all due apologies to the Calvinists that may be among us, we do have sovereignty. And that's sort of the problem. You see, the great mysteries, the great potter, doesn't get what he really wants out of the deal. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Will they? No. But as many as receive him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. You see, what stands in our way is ourselves. We need to be willing to be called to obedience. And one of the questions, we've got a lot, it's a full chapter, we've covered a lot of topics, but one of the things I'd like to leave you with as you drive home is to think very carefully about yourself. Are you really completely yielded to Him? And I don't mean in substance. I don't mean going to church every Sunday. I don't care what church you go to, that's not the issue. Or how regularly, that's not the issue. I think that was the message, right, in Matthew 23, as Jesus comments on this whole thing. It's the commitment that you and I manifest to Him, not to our neighbors, not to the neighborhood. Are we really yielded to Him? We, you and I, are also called to holiness. Not a holiness of our own energies. That's a waste of time. Most of you, I think, are sophisticated enough in New Testament to discover, have it, you have discovered, that that's not the answer. That's an exercise in futility. But you are called to holiness. And that doesn't come automatically. It doesn't come with a magic prayer. It doesn't come with a one trot down the sawdust trail. It's a commitment that seals your eternity, but it's also a commitment that needs to be renewed moment by moment in your daily walk. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.